Today I'm really excited to introduce our guest, Carmela Janfania. Carmela is a retired shiatsu practitioner and acupuncturist and Qijong instructor and an advocate, uh, a powerful advocate for a holistic lifestyle of well-being. So welcome, Carmela. Thank you for your patience in my introduction. Um, it's lovely to have you here to talk to you. I know you've got a fantastic journey to it to outline to us and some wonderful tips. Um, how are you? And how has been? How has the last year been for you? Wow. Well, it's been pretty tough, um, like for everyone. But um, just finding ways and managing, especially when you're living on your own, you've got to find the right way that's that's right for you. Um, so just incorporating all the wonderful inner resources that I've collected along the way, utilizing all those, they all help. And um, yeah, and just staying connected with friends, you know, distance at a distance, but that connection is really important. And just staying well, because that day is vital. Uh, we have to stay well, otherwise we can't help anyone else. So that's my theory on that one. That's a great start. Thank you. OK, well, yeah, it'd be really interesting for, for, for our viewers to perhaps trace back a little bit and, and how this all started, because your journey is quite a, uh, an epic journey to get where you are today. Perhaps you could talk us a little bit through how you became interested in in all this health and well-being really before it was it was health and well-being, I suppose, as well. It was um, it's been quite a journey. So perhaps you can guide us through a little bit how you yeah, along uh, you picked up all these tricks and uh, mm -hmm. along the way. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, uh, in the early 80s, I trained as a nurse, and I think that uh, initially sparked an interest in health in general. Uh, and then that evolved into uh, an interest in uh, more natural and alternative approaches to health. And then uh, I suppose around about the late 80s, I really immersed myself in self help books. I couldn't get enough of them. <laughs> I was reading them all the time just to manage my own mental well being. And um, and, and challenges at the time, and I found them really useful. Um, and um, uh, so, in those books, I discovered all sorts of things about the self, uh, your mindset, and um, about so the mind body connection, and uh, the plasticity of the brain, all these wonderful things. That, uh, and I thought, wow, they're, they're amazing. So, I just read and read, and then I came across um, um, books like. Um, you Can Heal Your Life by Louis Hay and um, Quantum Healing by Deepak Chopra, Chopra. And uh, they really inspired me then to look more seriously into the idea of training in complementary therapy. And then um, I first came across the word shiatsu in a, an encyclopedia of complementary therapy. I didn't even know I could pronounce it at the time. And, um, but it was something in that description that said something like, um, um, utilizing a mindful therapeutic um, touch to deeply connect, um, to facilitate or enable uh, a natural healing response in, in the recipient. And that blew me away basically. And I thought, oh, I like the sound of that. So, um, uh, and then round about that time, I went off traveling for a year. And um, when I was in um, Kathmandu, I stayed at a yoga center. And the chap there, the teacher, was also a yoga therapist. And he'd have people come in for one-to-one -one healing sessions uh, using yoga and breathing techniques. Uh, and you could really see the difference, you know, they'd leave vital and alive and open. And, you know, it was wonderful to see, really. Uh, and then uh, I found someone who did shiatsu. So I actually received my very first shiatsu massage in the top. <laughs> And it was outdoors. It was wonderful. So um, when I came back then, uh, I just had, you know, it was very clear in my mind what I wanted to do. And so I moved to um, London and started a three-year course with the European Shatsu School. And I, I just love it, loved it. Um, I used to bore my friends to death of all I talked about for three years, you know, Shatsu, Shatsu, Shatsu. It was just like a totally new world for me. Um, it was very exciting. It was uh, just a way, a, a new way of um, learning and uh, looking at the human body and the mind and uh, the connections and uh, seeing how um, the complexities of the mind and, uh, and the environment impact on, on, on the body. So for me, it was 
a wonderful um, feeling out to study, but also it, it helped me because when I started, I, I in those days, I was a very nervy, jumpy, um, highly strung sort of person, and I used to have trouble with panic attacks. So after the three years, I emerged a much calmer, confident person and no more panic attacks. So, you know, it helped me, um, and it's, uh, yeah, I've never looked back into that. That was a great training, great grounding. Um, and then uh, it was during the um, Shiatsu training that I was introduced to uh, Qigong. That was the first time I was introduced to Qigong. And um, he was teaching us a style called um, um, Baduan Jin, which is the eighth round of the blockade, which is a very ancient style of Qigong. Um, so that was the very first introduction. And Qigong really is, is like an umbrella term for lots of different healing exercises, you know, exercises that utilize the energy for better health, for self-healing, uh, for all uh, terms, Qigong, but they all have their individual names as well, you know. So um, from, uh, from there, I went on to study Wagong Qigong. And uh, at the time, I was going through a health scare. And um, by doing that Qigong, and uh, combined with taking Chinese first, that actually prevented a Need, the need for surgery, um, which had been recommended, so no, no more <laughs> need for surgery. So that was great. Um, and then since then, I've, I've studied um, Dragon Tiger Qigong, and and I'm qualified to teach Tai Chi Qigong uh, steps one and two. And they're, they're also known as Shi Ba Shi, which means eighteen, or as we say in Wales, Shi Ba Shi. That's how I heard it said here. Um, it's Shibashi or Tai Chi Qigong, and um, so it's a series of 80 moves, flowing, smooth flowing movements that we, uh, unify the mind, body, and breath for a real grounded, centered uh, connection. Um, yeah, so um, with Qigong, the, the word, uh, the meaning is um, the word Qi is obviously that means the energy, the universal energy that flows within the body throughout the channel network in the body. And um, the gong refers to work or exercise or persevering, you know, so it's about sticking with it, you know, persevering with the energy in order to use it um, for your self-healing, basically. Yeah. Wow, that, that's fantastic. You know, it's like an illustrated journey there, and you've taken us on there, Carmela. Yeah, fascinating how you started. You know, I suppose all those years ago. Um, did, you know, did you think it was it was it was perhaps all these practices were a little bit um, niche, a little bit perhaps people thought it was a little bit weird. Whereas now, well, thirty years on, it seems as if everyone is embracing breathing, uh, yoga, Pilates, and, and you know. Did, did you see that difference now? Did you feel a little bit on on the periphery of society oh, yeah. doing this? Oh, yeah, definitely. It was a minority thing, you know. But in, when I was in London and I studied the shiatsu, it was huge in those days. That, that was uh, the early 90s. It was huge. Right. And it was often uh, mentioned in maybe dramas or the bill. Someone happened to be a shiatsu <laughs> practitioner. It was like everywhere all of a sudden, you know. And the classes yeah. were big. There were about 30 people in the class where it all went a bit like this, which is a shame. I, I think, um, uh, what's it called, um, Reiki took over in popularity. Shatsu well, was always on, you know, a bit of the back foot, which is a shame, because it's a, it's a wonderful healing. Uh, yeah. Well, interesting, yes. Yeah. So, Go into the sort of, I suppose, the nug nuggets of, of, of these the podcasts we're looking at, uh, and, and and the issues we want to address about how how these these practices and um, you know uh, threads of life that we're all you know trying. Uh, how do you think it's impacted upon your um, physical and mental health and well being? And also, perhaps, if you want to share any stories, uh, how you've seen perhaps people that you've taught. Um, you know, uh, and, and they are changes or things that they've shared about how they perhaps just feel better, uh, etc. Um, yeah, how do you feel it really targets uh, our mental health then, you know, Qigong? Well, Qigong in particular, yeah. Yeah. Well, well basically, it's that grounding, uh, a sense of grounding and coming back to the body. So when we start to use the body, we're away from that busy mind, you know, that's uh, the primary thing. But 
by they start by coming into the uh, the body, connecting with yourself. Well, often in my sessions, I tend to do um, I tend to get people to connect first of all with their environment. Because when we're too busy in our heads, we can, you know, we could be anywhere, we're miles away, you know, we're not really connected with where we are. So that idea of first of all connecting with this space. If you're going through a bit of a, you know, a tough time emotionally, say, it's about just coming back, coming back to your place, uh, the body. I think the coming back to the body is really important. And the way of doing that is putting your hands on your belly. It's just a lovely way. And it's, it's often described as returning home. It's like returning to the comfort of your home, you know? So I love that idea. So it's about bringing well, your you, um, unhooking, I suppose, from thought without forcing, without pushing them out, because that never works. You're just bringing your attention, which is what mindfulness is as well. You know, you're bringing your attention to the body and uh, utilizing uh, the different uh, exercises. And, uh, and it's that idea of unifying the mind, body, and breath. So you're totally there, you're fully present, you're fully aware. Um, I have lots of people. I mean, I always remember a, a great example from uh, when I was teaching it at a mental health charity. A, a man uh, turned out quite agitated and restless, you know, and I just said, well, just join in, just do, do the exercises. And he did, thankfully. By the end, he blurted out, my head stopped. Wow. So it was just like, and that was wonderful to hear, you know. So, but I suppose you could say that would work with any kind of, you know, healing or, or you know, mindful uh, discipline, you know. Uh, yeah, that's a beautiful story. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with, with the Qigong, you know, it's about focusing on cultivating qi, so you can build up your qi. If you're feeling weak, you could do Qigong seated, you know, you can do it sitting down and develop slowly. You can actually help to build up the you know, reserve of energy, if you like. Um, and then it's about connecting with your energy and then getting things flowing, you know. Um, and yeah. posture really helps. Because, you know, when we're like this, we're feeling a bit, oh, you know, uh, that, that doesn't help with the way we feel. And not only that, you know, you're compressing joints, creating pressure on internal organs. So just by this opening out and having that good alignment and imagining that, that image in the Chinese character, you know, uh, grounded, mm. centered. You feel it makes you feel some stronger in yourself. Um, but then it's the movement, the warm ups are great for loosening, shaking. You know, they're not rigid. So it's just kind of, I think when you're feeling a bit not very well in that sense, emotionally maybe, you know, it's a good thing to kind of jiggle and <laughs> yeah, um, and yeah. People, you know, grounding and settling and find that the mind will settle. Um, actually, yeah. you know, that movement. That, that's, that's beautiful. Some lovely uh, images there come, come, come to my mind about the sort of processes at work with it. And, and, and I, I think because there's a lot of sceptical people out there, I think, and, and sometimes it can come across a little bit fluffy. But if you dig a, bit, a little bit deeper into it, I think, you know, there's a lot more evidence that I found a bit on my research for it, you know, from neuroscientists who are saying, you know, th things are happening when we're doing yoga you know, and, and, and these movements of breathing, you know, actual chemical changes in our brain, which can can sort of, you know, um, as you said, change change thought patterns, give us a, a sense of groundedness and, and presence. So it's not all fluffiness, is it? There's actual science at work, do you think, in our bodies uh, from this as well? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, yeah, if you were to measure what was going on internally, you'd see the difference, you know. Um, yeah. For any skeptic, I'd say give it a go. <laughs> Prove it in the body and see yeah. how you feel after, and then tell me how what you think of it. Yes, totally. Yeah. Okay. Um, just touching upon that as well, because um. You know, uh, would you say that the demographic that you work with perhaps are older people, say over 50, um, but that's myself as well, you know, or, or not? And, my, and leading on from that question, I'm really interested perhaps about older people's mental health, because I tend to feel it's somewhat neglected sometimes, you know, um, and perhaps society writes you know you know um elderly mental health as oh you know it doesn't really matter it's part of getting older etc do you feel well do you, do you have any thoughts on that really in the work you yeah. do 
about mental health and particularly the older demographic in our society that we should take more care and um you know uh, of supporting people in that community definitely, definitely. i mean it can yeah apply for anybody really but um hmm. i've got it i've had experience of um using qigong in our people homes uh, in abigaveni and uh, and i wasn't sure if they take to it so like, they take to slow movements and will they find it boring you know and I wasn't sure whether I knew to do it. And they loved it. You know, there was something about that. They did connect with that. And, and you know, getting them to focus on the breathing. Because, obviously, you know, if there is a degree of anxiety there, their breathing is going to be out of kilter, you know? So the fact that, you know, just suggesting to breathe lower and slower made a big difference. So, uh, yeah, it was interesting. So I wasn't sure if it was, you know, I, I just, I don't know what. I think it was my bias. I thought they might have concluded it and thought, oh, it's nonsense because it's too slow. But they, they did actually connect with it very well. And another, another funny thing, the opposite end, kids, young kids, yeah. when I'm doing it out, outside in the Cleveland here in Newport, um, the, we were facing like the, the, the school, uh, a new school by then, and the, the kids were out playing. And yeah, as you said, we are mostly 50 year old, 50 plus year old women. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't know why it's always like that, maybe the old man. Um, but uh, the kids, I thought they'll, they'll really, uh, they'll find it hilarious, you know, they'll they'll find it really funny. But they were all joining in. I was going, really? And it was quite funny to see, it was lovely actually. Um, and then the, the teacher came by and, and then she was looking, but I was, we were all surprised that, you know, they just joined in. We thought we'd be laughed at, you know. <laughs> But it was great to see the kids as well. Definitely, thank you. Okay. Um, uh, next question I was thinking, it's a pretty blunt question in a way. Can you stretch yourself and move yourself out of depression and anxiety, do you think, in your yeah. opinion? <laughs> well, it depends what's going on, obviously. Yeah. yeah. It depends how severe the thing is. You know, yeah. I think movement has got to be a part of the treatment, definitely. Um, because, yeah, if we're not moving, then, you know, nothing shifting within, you know, internally. So we need to make those shifts internally, you know. So, um, and you do that through the movement, you know. Um, mm. So, um, I, I think, uh, like with everything, um, one thing, uh, relying on one thing only never works. All right. So I think we need a, a, a big toolbox of different resources, you know. So, but I think energy, um, movement, stretching, incorporating the breath, anything like that has, is, a, is a definite must in, in that toolbox, you know. But uh, I think alone, you know, it's, it's like, a, um, I think a lot of people rely on one thing only to help themselves. And I, I don't think that works, you know, and then they say, oh, it's not working, I'm doing this. But it's not going to meet all your needs for one, is it? You know, so we have a variety of needs during the day, and we, we have to try and address those different needs. So definitely activity is great, you know, in the morning, especially rather than the night, so you get a better sleep if you spend more in the morning. And um, that will help you uh, ground you, it can help you feel clear in yourself, get rid of tension, you know, it can help you then maybe, it might help motivate you to do other things. But then, you know, we need to look at other things. And, um, so, you know, we need to eat well, mm -hmm. you know, food and mood, so the food has a big impact on, on the mood as well, yeah. and um, uh, we need to connect with others, definitely, you know, whether, even if it's on a, just on a Zoom, we do need that connection, it's vital. There's some fantastic points that you mentioned, and, and uh, you know, in a way, we are hoping with these um, podcasts that they form a, a, almost like a, a resource list that people can dip into. You know, you may not want to do breathing or go for a walk one day, but you could do yoga or stretching or um, look at your diet another. And it's like, like you said, there's all these different parts that, that make us up really and not relying on on perhaps just to pop a pill and think that's going to cure everything, you know? Um, yeah, and so you've answered a little bit of my next question, but um, it's, it's, if you had a magic wand and, and how would you like to see our health and social care system change perhaps and morph as we come out of, of the pandemic? Well, we need to change the priorities for a start. So well-being needs to be top. <laughs> so important that the well-being of the nation is, you know, top priority. Yeah. Um, so that's one. Um, money, they need funding, you know. 
because there's no point in saying, oh, well, you know, they're overstretched or, you know, they need the money, basically, from the government. So yeah. money needs to be injected in those services. There's been so many cuts over the years to, say, youth services. And what does that lead on to? Crime, people feeling, uh, getting ill, mental health breakdown, all sorts of problems, you know. So, yeah. So, and also I find, um, I think that the direct links of uh, harsh policies very difficult not to get political on this one, isn't it? <laughs> because, yeah. Um, okay. I think if, any, if you look at anything politically, uh, well, you have to look at all the components, and so you've got to look at, you know, the influence of, uh, and the impact of political. Um, of, um, oh, I can't think of the word now. Political ideology. Decision. Oh. Yeah. And um, so, if they um, if they're cutting services, the vital services. And they're also um, uh, cutting services to everybody else uh, and funding, I mean, for everybody else. Now, people, um, harsh uh, austerity measures affect individuals, so on an emotional, social, physical level. And so they're needing more care, but, the, but at the same time, the services that are meant to help these people are being squeezed. Doesn't make sense, does it? Yep. So we, you know, more money in those services so they can help more people, and more money for the people to boost their well-being, so they they're not creating an, uh, yet another burden, and also to look differently, you know, at the cause and effects. I suppose it's very easy to blame the individual. Ah, well, you eat too badly or you smoke too much, but what's underlying that, those bad or unhealthy choices? Often it's a it's a feeling of overwhelming unease brought on by the insecurity, in, you know, facing them regarding housing or jobs or, um, yeah, or finances, you know. So all those uh, pressures, yeah. Yeah. you know, is enough to, to, to lead to unhealthy choices. And so it's not, you know, it's not as easy as saying, ah, oh, but you're doing that, you know. Um, we need to look at what's underlying those unhealthy choices that people make, and and, yep. and again, it's politics, <laughs> politics and policies, and you know. So, and I I think we should challenge the government all the time. We, we mustn't let them off the hook ever, and highlight more um, the, the the direct link of their decisions, their policies, their harsh policies on you know directly on on the health of the nation. You know, they're contributing. To this. So, uh, yeah, big, huge difference. Yeah, change there. I think definitely you, you could look at the housing, for example, couldn't yeah. you? And, and that has such a massive impact on our mental health. You know, let alone our physical health. The insecurity, the high rents, the, the yeah. sense of you know being um, you know evicted, and, and all these sort of which can spiral, um, and the lack of social, you know, you know, affordable housing, etc. Yeah. So. You're right. It's, it's it's a big job, obviously, to look at the health of the nation. But um, yeah, if it, it almost feels the right time that you know perhaps Wales could lead the way and, and we could try yeah. some quite radical approaches. And ultimately, I think it would save save money if people felt exactly. better. As you mentioned, toolkit. You know, um, I wonder if you could perhaps offer some of your you know tricks of the trade and tools to put into the toolkit perhaps to, to, to leave you know the view with, with some really actionable uh, tools that they could take off into the world themselves to do with what what you advocate really what sort of things could we do on a daily basis do you think yeah. you know well, okay I, for me I, this is my new uh, thing that I'd love to promote regular breath break breath break so instead of a fag break a breath break Okay. I think if we incorporate that during the day, so as we're all over the place and just, you know, we're in our head, uh, ruminating 24 seconds, just stop for a, a breath break. And you could put a, you know, put it on your phone every 30 minutes, you know, oh, that's my breath break. <laughs> just to break that monotony and that, you know, rumination 24 7. So, and it just, as, as I said before, it's about coming back, you know, to the body, to the self. And it helps you make better choices, I think, you know, once you're, ah, you know, back home, you're not here worrying about everything and the future and the regret, you're not focused or hooked on those ideas and so you're back here. And once you're back here and you're breathing, you're more likely to have uh, uh, some 
new inspiration as to how to go forward, you know, and give you a bit more motivation, just give you a sense of hope for you. But having a, a gratitude journal, right? I yeah. think is really good. And um, <clears throat> yeah. Do, did yeah. you mean to write down in write down things that you are you know appreciate during the day? You sort of mean yeah. like a practice of that. Day, yeah, at the end yeah. of the day, there's time to do it. I think it's really good because it's so easy for us to feel sorry for ourselves sometimes. We think, oh, it's all going wrong and everything is awful. And then just by doing that, that yeah. was me, by the way, I'm mocking myself, not knowing that. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, we all tend to go into that space, don't we? And um, so by writing what you're grateful for during, you know, at the end of each day really helps put things back into perspective. Yeah, it does. And I was reading about that funny enough because I do a version of that with with my writing workshops. Mm -hmm. And then I, when I looked into it, it was saying that actually those feelings of gratitude mm -hmm. uh, it can actually release serotonin in our brain, which is which is settling us. So we're not craving something far away. We are yeah. sort of. Which is again, that's fascinating. Now, the, the brain, you know, the body brain connects there, and and, and like you said, it, it sort of, um, yeah, it, it sates us in a way, yeah. you know, yeah. So it's again, people might say, well, that's a bit fluffy, but if when you um, when you dig down into it, there's actual science behind uh, gratitude. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I love the breath break, is a breath break, <laughs> sorry, um, and as you said, diet and being passionate about things and gratitude they're great they're very simple when you think of it aren't they you can cost anything yeah all simple all doable one more thing oh. <laughs> is um this idea of happiness and now i i i struggled with that for years on this the idea that happiness is here right now it's a mindset so and i um you know we often think happiness arrives when everything is just right in its place when it's perfect, then happiness comes. No, it's re it really is a mindset. So I've been practicing that one because that was the one I thought, well, this idea that mm, uh, there's a lovely quote about um, uh, happiness is here right now, in the, in the, right now, in the here and now. Um, oh, I always forget my quotes. I'll come back to that one. <laughs> okay. That's the fact. Not strive, you don't need to strive to find happiness. It's there, it's, it's your mindset. It's in the relaxation and the letting go. And um, so I've been working with that and I've been working on waking up with a joyful spirit. And it does help because at the end of the day, it is a mindset and it's something you choose. To so choose. Could, could, could you give us an example of how you wake up and create mm -hmm. that joyful spirit? I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got a bit overwhelmed early on in the pandemic with all the state of the world, you know, everything was getting to me. I thought, oh my God. And I was waking up feeling this sense of, oh, you know, fear, terrible. I thought, we can't do this every day. This is wrong. And then I thought, okay, if this idea of happiness being a mindset, I'm going to tap into it. And I, and, and I can't describe it, but you literally consciously decide, I'm waking up. I just look at the window, what's out there, the sunshine, and you immediately, you're in focus, you're, you're mindful immediately. And what's the choice? You know, the option is that we wake up miserable yeah. and uh, in despair. And where does that take us? You know, and I think with any of these things, where people are skeptical, it's always to look at the alternative. What's the alternative? Do you want to choose misery? Or do you want to choose happiness you know it's a bit like that I, okay i'm not putting you know that there's an awful lot to be miserable about you know real situation i'm not talking about that yeah i think on a general day-to-day -day level yeah you can either choose to feel grumpy all day and you know have, have the day that accordingly or have that different mindset and again it's a totally different perspective and experience that you'll have in the day yeah that, that's a beautiful one to end with guys wow that's that's really interesting really fascinating. I think, you know, a viewer is going to take so much from that.